So um, I wanted to continue. Uh, this is the second part, I suppose you could say, on um, worthiness, as we were talking about in the previous rather long video. Um, and um, what I wanted to do was just continue by um, listing a few of the uh, artists that I think fall into the category of worthiness um, who are doing things that aren't necessarily commercial but I personally feel that they have worth and you you may agree with me um, you might not and that, that's all fine um, but I think that um, I, I wanted this this video to be more positive okay so what, what I want to do is just just look at a few acts then that I think are worth looking at and have worth and um, they're slightly different um, from each other hopefully so let's let's just let's just start off so I've, I've had to write these down otherwise I'm just gonna forget about them but um, I'll show things up on the screen anyway um, I'll move me to one side and you'll, you'll get more information on the screen um, so there's a guy called Nigel uh, Stanford now it's electronic music and um, he, he's, he sort of produces you know fairly standard catchy electronic almost sort of dancey type music was well, well produced but the music itself is is um, not particularly original but catchy it is catchy it's good I like it I like it um, but what he does which is a really nice little spin on on music um, is that he broke programs uh, he programs non-musical technology, industrial robots, to play music on his behalf. Um, so, essentially what he's doing is he, he, he programs industrial robots to play a musical instrument. It could be a drum, um, could be a keyboard, uh, I think he's even got um, a couple playing a, um, a bass guitar which is on a table, but you'll have a look in the links. Uh, and um, so what he's doing is he's, he's not only using a door and producing his own music and, and programming stuff in, he's having to pro uh, within the, um, uh, the door, he's also having to program the industrial robots to play the piece of music, to be able to capture it. And that's, that is a, that's a, a really nice... Um, spin on industrial electronic music to get the robots themselves to play it. Um, you can't really appreciate this until you see the videos. That's the only thing. Once you cut off the video and you only hear the music, it just it's it comes across as pretty you know good quality good quality but a standard fare. Um, so yeah have have a look. Nigel Stanford, well worth um, uh, checking him out. Well, the next one on my list um, is called The Caretaker and the piece of work that I've been looking at was um, Everywhere at the End of Time. Now the guy's not a musician, he's actually a, a pretty good artist. I've seen some of the, some of the quite unusual um, uh, paintings that he's done and some of the ones I've seen are actually uh, each of the pieces of his I suppose music but the project but essentially he's he's um, he's an artist and her name is James Kirby um, I um, the caretaker and um, what he did with um, with uh, this I think it's sort of six and a half hour piece of music where he has explored the advancement of dementia in six stages and so um, so what he's doing is from the start to finish uh, across the sort of six and a half hours long piece um, it's the gradual sort of uh, fading away of sense and memory 
um, and he uses turntables and um, sampled uh, records and uh, ambient sounds to create something that goes on in, in a, uh, a person's head um, and yes it really is uh, I mean it is just a, an odd thing not easy to listen to um, but it actually does deal with a um, quite an awful uh, condition and it's one that my mother is going through at the moment um, so I I found it really interesting um, to not only read up on what on what he was doing I thought it was quite a brave thing to do actually but how it's gained um, allow people to have some sort of glimpse or insight into what goes what goes on um, so I thought that's quite a brave attempt uh, what does it sound like well it's disorientating certainly um, it's uh, abstract sometimes quite haunting um, so it's, it's a soundscape really that feels like something is closing in over time it's uh, something is breaking down and indeed that is what's happening um, yes it's not it's not a uh, it's not songs and it's not necessarily music but it is a soundscaping which has a has a purpose so that's worth having a a, a listen so you can have a look at the link and see what you think um, yeah caretaker now the next group band are Radiohead um, I did not I am denied about putting Radiohead in but um, yeah I think that I think what's what was important about Radiohead is, is not only that they're, they're still around now but that they how they have changed their style how they have experimented through the life of the band um, and not rested on their laurels I suppose um, and it's interesting to me because I don't like some of the later stuff I much prefer the early stuff um, because it is more musical but I absolutely appreciate what they've done with things like Kid A and Rainbows and uh, I, I, I can appreciate it um, as, as an artist that's wanting to sort of stretch and, and is bored with, with doing things the same old way is searching for some sort of soundscape that's different um, and it encompasses a lot of different styles. You, you, you can't help but respect the work, the whole catalogue of, log of work that they've, that they've done. Um, now, what was interesting was that, that to me was that um, I went to see James live in 90, oh gosh, when was it? 93. And, um, before James came on there was a support band who just blew me away I know a fantastic fantastic band I mean they they um, yeah there was there was sort of urgency about the music there was something really really so sort of quite punky about about what they were doing but it was very musical and that was um, uh, that was Radiohead. That was the, the first time I saw them. Ne I'd never heard of them before, uh, and they were on tour, obviously doing Pablo Honey, the first, the first album. So I liked the first four albums, and then I just, uh, I wasn't really interested in what they were doing. Uh, I, I didn't want to spend too much time listening to the uh, the stuff after after the first four albums. Uh, but always had an ear out and always took the time to listen to some of the stuff they were doing live uh, and in studio sessions so Radiohead are definitely up there as being uh, worthy um, right next 
Next up we've got, well, another well-known, um, Björk. Now, she's always been alternating styles of writing. She includes jazz, um, electronic pop, trip-hop, choral, house, classic. She, she just does everything. It appears her own way. And still manages to produce some often beautiful music. Um, so I, I have to include uh, Björk here. Um, just again, haunting, but cons just some of the melodies that she puts together, and then the people that she works with, and the uh, uh, the the sounds that she produces. So it's just the, the breadth of work that she's done and the styles that she, that she, um, she works within. Um, and she does acting as well, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, she's done some, some film work as well. So I got, that's another one you've got to give credit to, that um, she's a very original artist. Um, do you know, I thought about putting Kate Bush there, but um, she's kind of not really done much. Kate Bush was always a favourite of mine years ago, um, very strong writer, but I think for this, and equally worthy, but, but because we're trying to keep someone, uh, uh, we're trying to keep this current, current artists, um, I'm going to list Björk there as, as, um, as a, a, a relevant artist that, who is still producing music, still working. <clears throat> not retired. Um, right, the next act is a little bit more unusual. Wintergarten. Now this is uh, the Swedish guy which you may have seen on YouTube. Uh, I mean, years ago he was in all the newspapers um, and um, Martin Molin, Swedish, and he built, programmed and played the 2000 Marble Musical Instrument Machine. If you haven't seen it, um, pop along to that link and, and have, a, have a listen, because it's fantastic. Again, the music is not necessarily the most important part. It absolutely is... Um, He's produced a wooden machine, a clockwork mechanical machine, with thousands of ball bearings. And the ball, where the ball bearings hit and what they hit produces the music. So he's got one hooked up, he's produced his own drum um, with the ricocheting of the marbles. He's got them ricocheting off bass strings so that they're, they're playing a sequence on a bass guitar. Um, all hand wound and it is just a it's a piece of engineering um, but it's it's just a wonderful alternative view to how you can create music uh, just just a lovely idea and of course it goes steps beyond music it's the not necessarily even the thinking about the music as much as thinking about how you get this machine um, to work and play the music that you're producing so you're producing your own instrument that again much like the robots of, um, uh, of the other fella um, will actually play the music so have a have a look at that. That it's a, just a fantastic piece, um, and it is a obviously a very much a, a physical winding up the machine, stopping it, pulling levers, and it produces this amazing music. So um, Martin M Molin, I think it is, or Molin, Swedish. I may have may have um, got his name wrong. Um, yeah. That's another one. Right, uh, now I'm going to he head for a band that um, they're still around but they sort of dip down un under, the, under the radar. Um, they are um, Danish band Mew. 
Now, when I first heard some of their early stuff, um, I think the first single was Am I Rye? And I was struck as a musician by what these musicians were doing. They were changing time signatures, um, they were they had some some lovely rhythms going on in the background. It's almost you could almost say, wow, this could be this could be prog, prog rock. As we know, progressive music seems to be um, very much known for time signature changes or, and, and uh, extended long pieces of music. I know it's more than that, but it, it, it kind of, you would expect that, a sort of cleverness uh, um, comes into play with um, what's known as progressive music. So anyway, they, they Mew unusually have this element in their music but they can write, they don't go off on a tangent and write a 20 minute number, they'll write a 5 minute number, which can be released as a single. And of course the other thing is that there's almost something Euro pop about them, which I know that other people have found it difficult to, um, to forget the voice is almost falsetto, very high, a little, you know, I thought, it, in fact, it was a, um, a woman, a girl singing, but it's not. Um, but there's a, there's a sort of sweetness about it, a poppiness element. But then you've got, it rides on the back of this really intelligently crafted music that has this sort of hard-hitting moments, um, almost cinematic. Listen to Am I Rye and you'll understand. And there are some other pieces in there as well, which are, um, ju which are just wonderful. Just wonderful. So, um, yes, Mew. Um, first seen in 2005, slightly Euro pop, but not look deeper. Listen better to them. And, and you, you might not like them, but there's something quite unusual going on there. And I think that, that uh, um, being able to release something that's a single, but actually doing something with time signatures that's different, um, I, I think is, a, I think is um, an, an interesting, interesting element. Okay, um, David Bowie. Now, I did mention him in the previous video. I just have to include David Bowie um, because, you know, from someone who start, you know, the, produced The Man Who Sold the World to Black Star, um, you know, from like 19, what, 1970 to 2016, and was continually changing, um, reinventing himself. Uh, always working in with different people um, just that ability to do that from the 70s 1970 to 2016 is, is is amazing and to stay relevant and this is the thing that Bowie unusually even as he got older stayed relevant he knew how to ride the, the, the tide of fashion he was had an ability to go slightly beyond it or behind it but the guy was so cool that even when he was behind it it was like he was in front of it so um, that persona that he was able to um, elicit from somewhere and maintain is part of the worthiness um, the music you could say is always always to a standard always looking at working in 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 different ways and with different styles um you can't ignore the body of work so i've got to put david bowie in there i know he's not with us anymore um at, but um his work is still still very much relevant and it, it doesn't feel like it was uh you know a few a few years ago four years ago that, that he died. I can't, I can't believe it. Um, so I've got to put David Bowie in there. Um, the next band 
uh, again like Björk, Icelandic, uh, is um, Sigur Ross. Um, around 2002, I was looking for just some sort of different music to get into, and a friend put a track on CD for me. Um, he said, "Oh, I think I think you'd like this. This is different, and some of the some of the phrasing of the guitar work sort of sounds like old stuff that you've done. So, yeah, I think you'd like the guitar work as well." So. I gave it a listen and it was just amazing and I thought oh, I've heard that on TV and on radio and and it was the, the uh, sort of piano based track um, which was uh, had been used all over the place uh, Hopper Puller Hopper Puller I don't even know how you pronounce it um, I did actually have a look to see how you pronounce Hoppipola, and um, to me it didn't say, seem right. If that's if it's Icelandic, it, surely it's got a there's an accent there, and you wouldn't say it, but you wouldn't pronounce it Hoppipola. Um, but that's what a, a lot of these um, websites were doing. Oh, so so they're, not, they're not right. Anyway, it was it was brilliant, um, and I was just hooked on their music. I've literally bought everything in the next year that they that they produce so watch the YouTube um, Jonesy the, the, again he's the very full falsetto uh, vocal you either like it or you don't maybe it's a bit Marmite for people um, and he I suppose now famously uses the um, um, a very electric guitar with a violin bowed with a lot of, of um, reverb effects to produce these very um, soaring organic tones behind the music um, just fantastic has the orchestral element has beautiful choral elements as well um, similar to to that, that, that aspect of Björk as I, I, I think but um, um, what I liked about them was that they they would one minute produce music that was just beautiful and sweeping and almost classical and uplifting, and the next minute they'd be using samples and technology and that 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 would kind of clash, and then the next minute they're working with orchestras or they're we're working with um, um, a, a, um, a quartet and so very rich. And it doesn't even matter that with the lyrics um, that were either nonsense or Icelandic, um, it doesn't matter that you don't know what's what's being said. What you end up doing is listening to the words and the music and just being drawn in by the whole experience. Um, it, almost doesn't matter that you don't know what the song's about. They produce a lot of very strong video work as well from independent artists that produce video for them to um, uh, to stuff that they, uh, films that they produce as well. Um, so uh, Sigur Rós, they're, they're fantastic. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to them over the years and they're, they're st still, going, still going strong. Um, my next is probably an unusual one. I am not a lead rock guitarist type person. I I love melodies and I can play a little bit of lead melodies if they make sense. I'm not a fast player. I've never been interested in in fast fret work. To me, it's um, to me it doesn't really show any clarity or about music in any way uh, it's 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 kind of a little bit like it's a little bit like owning a Ferrari um, being able to play fast so and that's not me I'm not the showy type anyway this this guy is a uh, uh, Guthrie Govan um, those guitarists who our guitarists, guitarists, will know who Guthrie Govan is. Um, 
I have watched him over a number of years and have been stunned at the virtuosity. I also think he is he's an English guy, he's very different from a lot of the real speed freak guitarists of other countries. Um, uh, it, to, to such a degree that I would say he's, uh, it's not even, it's partly not even the fact that he's um, an incredibly versatile and original guitarist that impresses me. It does. To me, he's beyond a guitarist. He teaches. Um, and I would say that he's a, he's a kind of zen-like guitar philosopher. And that's what I like about him, that the, the absolute um, entrenchment of his craft comes with it an understanding of life. And that's what he, he talks about. Whenever you hear him speak, he knows all the rules of music. He seems to know he's studied other types of music as well from, from different cultures. Um, from what from what he says in, in the conversations that he has with people, but he's just um, just superb. And then when you listen to him playing with different people, he does the, this incredible these incredible things with the guitar, and you can't just say it's technical. It's a lot of it is the new techniques that he produces and uses on his own music come about from a. Um, such skill and speed that he puts the feel back in by changing, you know, the way he bends notes is just, I, I, I don't know, I, I see him do it and I think that is just beautiful, everything's at the right time, even when he's making stuff up on the, on the hoof, um, but it, it comes with it, um, it, it comes with a real emotion and feel that I think yeah, I think the the feel is before the the, the technical side. It, I think it just it it carries the technical side rather than the technical side carrying the feel. He is so in tune with his instrument that um, uh, that the feel is just a, it's just a wonderful thing to watch. Maybe uh, you would have to be a guitarist to appreciate it uh, to a to a degree. Maybe. I might be doing people a disservice, but I think you can certainly appreciate it if you just love that sort of music. Um, so I, I've got to put Guthrie Govan there um, as well. Um, I wouldn't actually put any other guitarist in, even though I'm a guitarist myself. I don't have guitar heroes, and, and he's not a guitar hero of mine, but absolute respect. Um, I see something very special in that guy that I don't see with other guitarists. Um, He's also very quiet, and I like that. I, I like the fact that he's thoughtful and quiet, and yet can talk about all these things uh, and teach. And um, so he, he's a he's a special he's a special one. Um, How could I have done this? I've uh, missed one of my favourite bands off the list. Um, so just a quickie. Um, yeah, Flaming Lips. They've got to go on the list. Um, they're refreshingly different. Uh, they've got a humour that is lacking in so many other bands. Um, they produce catchy, chaotic, um, loose and tight music, all sorts, all sorts of. It, it's a real cornucopia of um, music and styles, and they're, they're they're sort of low tech, reminiscent of seventies music. Um, they just always seem like they're having fun. It doesn't even matter that the guy can't really the main fella can't really sing properly, can't hold a note. I I, I love it all. I think it's great. Um, so I've got to put Flaming Lips in there. Um, 
you know, they're, they're just so organic and human as a band. And uh, I've got to say, the, the, the gigs um, that they do are just, just look like so much fun. Like they're having so much fun. That's, that's rare. Um, you know, they, they've, they've had hits. They've produced obscure music. Um, yeah, they're, for me, they're a bit of a one-off. They're a little bit like Bowie in a way. They're, they're just a one-off. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I always enjoy listening to them. Um, it, it's actually a... It's just refreshing. I, I walk away from listening to um, Flaming Lips and things are a little bit better with the world. Um, it's like a detox. It's, it's actually a musical detox. So, yeah, I, I, I had to include Flaming Lips. Um, that was it. Uh, my bad. Uh, I don't know how they got left off the list, but there you go. Um, that's it. Catch you soon. Now I'd like to finish on one one person that I, I don't know much about, but I have actually gone and um, uh, I, I've looked looked them up, and it's a guy called Elliot Sharp who's been around for many years. Um, and if I were to say that. Um, His music is difficult to listen to. That might be an understatement. It's one of those things where someone pulls apart music and an instrument and what it can do so far that it ceases to become music that we would accept. Now, are they just way out there and we're left behind? Or... Are they producing nonsense? This is very much the question of, um, of art the world over. Elliot Sharp is a little bit like that. And I'm not going to say whether what he does is amazing or crap. But take a listen and see what you think. Um, my worry is that we intellectualise things sometimes, that we want to push the boundary so far that we lose sight of where music began and ended, and what is acceptable to most people. I think if you're just sitting in your own room doing this sort of stuff that, that he does, and no one heard it, the world would not be a poorer place. So I don't know what he brings to the table. And I don't even know, I guess he has to be genuine because he's been doing this for so many years. But is it a bridge too far? Well, for, for some people they're going to say yes. Um, is it a postmodernist shambles? Is it that he hates music and he just wants to tear it all down? Um, or is it just simply too difficult to stop for us to stop calling music and understanding what music is? Is it is it that that music is something else and that we're listening to music in a really shallow, narrow way? Is it that he's expanding that or attempting to expand that? Well, I don't know. See, I I like music to stir something in me, hopefully a positive stirring as well, not a negative one, not a, oh God, switch this off. Um, it doesn't have to be happiness. It can be anything. Um, but I just think that when music becomes too abstract for my brain, I cease to see it as pleasant, as music that can take me on a journey, as something that connects with my brain and, and helps my brain to function in a particular way and helps me to hear things as a visual or helps me to see things. Music, I see things with music and a lot of people do, which is why film needs music. 
um, more often than not to bolster the narrative. Um, it can manipulate the audience into feeling a particular way. Uh, sometimes it's um, the music is used because the film is actually quite poor, can't really do it on its own. Um, I've seen some experimental pieces where um, film where music isn't used for that reason. It's it's all about the visual, um, so that you can't use music as a prop to make people feel a particular way. It's it's all down to the film, the visual side. Uh, so that's quite interesting, but um, yeah, I, I have a problem with this, and maybe that's me, maybe it's my failure. Um, and this is my problem with something called experimental. At what point do you jump off and say, I'm out of here? Um, uh, you know, abstract art and music. I mean, and it, see, the, this is the thing there. It's really easy to con people into thinking something is a great piece of art if you've got enough people that you respect pointing at it and saying that's a great piece of art. Um, I love the stories that we get about um, monkeys that are just sat down and given paint pots and a big canvas and they can do shit all over it. And, um, and then it's framed, put in a gallery, and we're told it's someone else. And people are quite happy to accept it. Uh, J Jackson Pollock in his younger years, or, you know, I don't like Paul Klee. I think, I think it's rubbish. I think that stuff's rubbish. But that's just my opinion. You can tell me the story, the narrative about what it's supposed to mean, and I get nothing back from it. Really not interested. Um, Jackson Pollock, pretty pat nice patterns but I'm not interested uh, I'm not even interested in in the narrative why um, it, it does nothing for me um, but it for other people it will so this is the interesting thing with all these acts that um, for me I think they have a worth and that's that's that that's the richness I, I mentioned before about the um, where there's too much of this sort of noise that's out in the open in the public, that sort of dusty frosting I mentioned before. To me, all these acts, with the possible exception of Elliot Sharp, because I wanted to end on that one as a as a thought for what for what uh, whether that is still acceptable or whether we think it's a con in some way. Um, but the other acts are that as I mentioned before, that rich seam of music. And occasionally they pop up, surface, and we all get to hear them, you know, in our lazy way. They'll, once that they're on the radio, they'll be up on the playlists, they'll suddenly be there, they'll be all pervasive for a while, and then they disappear again. And then they get covered up with more stuff. Um, they all, all these acts for me, and again, it's just a very personal view, they're doing something that is of worth and makes music as a whole, as a, mu a musical community, helps to maintain it and keep it worthy. Um, without these artists, some of them doing very, diff very different things, some of them you'll never hear on the radio, the point is, it's generating, it's what we do as people, it's generating ideas and creativity. It's the what if, or I want to do this. Um, and I think without that richness, um, you can't sustain music. So there we go. They were just little introductions, just just my thoughts on what I think uh, I think are, are worthy acts. Um, you might disagree. If you have any others that you think are doing really interesting stuff and you'd like to comment, please do that. And I will always go and have a look um, at, at the links. Um, I'm always up for for learning about new bands and new music that um, that uh, just get the juices going again, or, or or just make me think in a slightly different way. I'm I'm always up for that. Um, there you go. So 
I think we finished here. So that is uh, the second part of my worthiness. Um, I think we'll call that it. I don't think we need to go any further. Uh, my next video will be um, an update on my next album um, and um, I'll be I think putting in a few rough demo pieces of music as well. Um, so that'll be then. Uh, I don't know whether it'll be before Christmas or after. We're almost on. Christmas is almost upon us. But um, that's it. So we'll talk to you soon. Okay? You keep well.